Heavenly Father, we honor you this evening. We worship and exalt you. What a joy and privilege we have again to fellowship in your word. We open our hearts to hear from you, to receive guidance and instruction. Speak to our hearts this evening. Minister to every one of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, so we're gathered again in the name of Jesus. And we are here again for yet another Bible study. And um, we are talking and sharing from the book of Hebrews. We have been, uh, <clears throat> we started off a study in the book of Hebrews. And um, through the last two weeks, we did an introduction. And um, we did uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3. And so today, we will be going through chapter 4 of the book of Hebrews. Now, in chapter 4, you find a prevailing theme, a very important theme that reminds us of something that's very close to the heart of God, the aspect of the issue of rest. God is very interested in rest, and so uh, this scripture here in the book of Hebrews talks extensively, really through chapter 4, through verse 1 to about verse 11, is, is completely dedicated to the subject of rest. And for a start, I'd like us to read through the book of Hebrews chapter 4. The Bible says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to come short of it. For indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them, but the word which they had did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who had it. For we who have believed do enter that rest, as he has said, so I saw in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the, the works were finished from the foundation of the world. For he has spoken in a certain place of the, of the seventh day, in this way, in this way, and God rested on the seventh day from all his works. And again in this place they shall not they shall not enter my rest. Verse 6 says, Since therefore it remains that some must enter it, and those to whom it was first which did not enter because of disobedience, again he designates a certain day, saying in David, Today, after such a long time, as it has been said, Today if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Hallelujah. He who has entered his rest has himself also seized from his works as God did from his. Verse 11 says, Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. I'm going to start, first of all, in those first 11 verses. Okay, so you see there is an aspect, there is an emphasis in these 11 verses on the subject of rest. And um, the scripture has given tremendous emphasis, which helps us to understand that this is extremely important to God. Well, I think we, it was verse 9 that we read which said that there remains, there remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Very importantly, he states that if Joshua had given them rest, then there would not have been reason for God to speak about another day uh, being a day of rest. If what Joshua gave to them was rest indeed or rest in its final sense, then God would not have spoken about another day of rest. Praise the name of the Lord. I believe that was about verse, um, verse, verse 8. It says, For if Joshua had given them rest, then he would afterward 
then he would not afterward have spoken of another day. Now let me just pause here to first say that when we looked at chapter 3, we saw the aspect of rest being introduced. But the rest there was a foreshadow. The rest there was the rest that uh, was promised by God to the children of Israel and it was the will of God, the desire of God, that every one of those of his people that came out of Egypt should all enter into rest. We're going to take a moment to try and understand what is rest. Okay? But all those that came out of Egypt all enjoyed the same promise, all enjoyed the same protection, the same covering, the same uh, God, and the will of God was that all of them should journey into the promised land. But the Bible says that God was dis disappointed and he was wrathful with them because they did not obey him. They walked in unbelief and thus he said they will not enter into his. To chapter 4, he begins to unfold this subject of rest, but introducing to us yet another aspect of rest, or rather introducing to us the, the rest that we as children of God in the new covenant are invited to enjoy and benefit from. Praise them. So once again, I'm going to invite you, come with me to the book of um, uh, Hebrews chapter 4, reading verse 1 again. The scripture says, Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, okay, so there's a promise of entering his rest. The Bible says, Let us fear, lest any of you seem to come short of this. So we read this verse in the, in the New International Version and also in the Amplified. Extremely important verse to understand. And um, I'm taking a slightly different uh, approach to uh, chapter 4. Uh, the last few chapters, chapter 1, 2, and 3, our emphasis was looking at the scripture in light of the audience that was being spoken to. But in this, in this uh, chapter, uh, my focus is not going to be entirely on the audience to which the scripture was written, but to all of us that are beneficiaries of this, the truths that are exposed in this, uh, in this chapter. So Bible says in the New International Version, therefore, since the promise of entering his rest still stands, in other words, it was not concluded in the Old Covenant, it, was not, it did not end with Joshua, since the promise still stands, let us be careful that none, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. Okay? So this is a caution that God was giving to his people. And the Amplified it says, therefore, while the promise of entering his rest still holds, hallelujah, to this day it still holds, and is offered today, let us be afraid to distrust it lest any of you should think he has come too late and has come short of reaching it, okay? So he's warning us or cautioning us that we should not fall into the same position of the people in the old covenant. They had a promise of entering into his rest, but they came short of it. They came short of it because of their disobedience. They dis disobeyed God. They walked in unbelief. When God gave them promise, when they looked at the circumstances, when they listened to the reports of those who came and, uh, um, and told them about giants and uh, the impossibilities of taking the land, they in unbelief disobeyed the, the word of God. And for that reason, they would not enter into rest. Okay? So the word of God warns us or cautions us that therefore sins and when he says therefore means his quote, he, he, uh, when the word therefore is used here, it's stating therefore um, that something has been said prior. And so we understand in chapter 3 he talked about rest. Okay? So therefore since the promise of entering his rest still stands, let us be careful that none of you be found to have fallen short of it. I want to say to you, child of God, that we in the new covenant also enjoy 
a promise of entering into his rest. Okay? For example, when you come with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 11, reading verse 28, Jesus made a bold declaration. Jesus made a bold declaration. He said, Matthew eleven twenty-eight. 28, he says, Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Please take note here that Jesus is promising those who come to him rest. Okay? So it's extremely important for those of us in the new covenant to understand what rest is about or what rest is. Okay? So what then is rest? Rest is a place of peace which is a result of knowing God. When we know God, when we come to know God, hallelujah, we have rest. Jesus saying in verse 29 says, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Okay. So when we come to know him, when we know who he is, when we know his greatness, his goodness, then we walk into confidence. So rest is talking about confidence. It's talking about assurance. It's talking about satanity. It's talking about being confident in God. Praise the name of God. So rest is a place of peace, which is a result of knowing God. Rest is a place of liberty. It's a place of freedom, a place of deliverance. Exodus chapter 33 and verse 14 Exodus chapter 33, reading verse 14, the word of God says, And he said, and he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Okay? The assurance of having him with us gives us rest. He says, And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. Okay? So God promises his people rest. And we're going to see this repeatedly in the scripture that God promises his people rest. He promises his people rest. Deuteronomy chapter 12, reading verse 9 and verse 10. Deuteronomy chapter 12, reading verse 9 and verse 10. The Bible says, For as yet you have not come to the rest, and the inheritance which the God is giving you. Verse 10 says, But when you cross over the Jordan and dwell in the land which the Lord your God is giving you to inherit, and he gives you rest from all your enemies round about, so that you dwell in safety. So rest is a place where God's people receive the inheritance. So when we receive our inheritance, that's a place of rest. When we receive promise, when we receive promise, that's a place of rest. When we have victory for, over our enemies, that is a place of rest. Praise the name of the Lord. Uh, come with me, Joshua 1 and verse 13. Joshua 1 and verse 13, the scripture says, Joshua chapter 1 verse 13 says, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, the Lord your God is giving you rest and is giving you this land. Hallelujah. Okay, so receipt of the land, receiving their promised land was a place of rest. Praise the name of the Lord. When they journeyed out of Egypt, they had a promise to go into the promised land. And getting into the promised land signified entering into their rest. So the promise, rest is a place of promise for his people. Hallelujah. Uh, uh, Joshua 11 and verse 23. Joshua 11 and verse 23. Uh, the Bible says, Joshua 11 and verse 23 says, So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the, the Lord had said to Moses, and Joshua gave it as an inheritance to Israel according to the divisions by their tribes, then the land rested for more. So the absence of war, the absence of war, peace and tranquility are examples or is a position of rest. 
I stated earlier, Joshua 21 verse 43, victory over our enemies, victory over enemies is rest, okay? So, for example, extrapolating that to the new covenant, if one comes to Christ and gets to know Christ, their victory over enemies, victory over sin and the works of the flesh is rest, okay? Joshua 21 43 declares, and the Lord gave them rest, and the Lord gave them rest all around, around, according to all that he had sown to their fathers, and not a man of all their enemies stood against them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Praise the Lord. So when they have victory, when we have victory over enemies, we enter into rest. Hebrews chapter 4, reading verse 9 and verse 10. Hebrews chapter 4, reading verse 9 and verse 10. The Bible says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. Verse 10. For he who has entered his rest has himself also seized from his works as God did from his. Okay? Notice this. That he who has entered his rest, his rest, has himself also seized from his works as God seized from his. So, rest is a place in God. Rest is a place where we have come to know him, where we have come to trust him, where we've come to believe in him. Rest is a place where we've come to embrace his promises. Rest is a place, uh, a spiritual position. In the old covenant, what the promised land signified um, a place of rest, but that rest was temporal, it was physical, hallelujah. But the rest that we have in the Messiah, the rest that we have through Jesus, is a spiritual rest. Which rest provides us not only spiritual rest, but emotional and mental rest. We have confidence, we have assurance in God, hallelujah. So rest is an important place for every child of God. This, he who has entered his rest, okay, so there's a place of rest in him. He who has entered his rest, his rest is a place of promise, his rest is a place of dwelling, place of confidence, a place of assurance. He who has entered his rest himself also has seized from his works. See, when we rest, when we come into him, when we get into him, we rest, we seize from our works, from our labors. Hallelujah. As God did from his, we rest from... So rest is a place, the absence of struggle, the absence of agitation. It's a place of trust and confidence in God. Amen. Now, how do we enter into rest? How do we enter into rest? How do we enter into rest? Now, going back to verse 2 of Hebrews chapter 4, we saw in verse 1 that he, therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us be careful so that none of us should seem to come short of it. Hallelujah. Verse 2 says, for indeed the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which they had did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in those who had it. Now listen, he's talking about rest, and then all of a sudden goes to begin to talk about the gospel. What does that mean? It means that entry into rest has something to do with believing, receiving, embracing the gospel. There is a reason why the gospel was preached. Notice here, for indeed the gospel was preached to us. Now that word gospel is talking about good news. When they were in the land of bondage, when they were in the wilderness, and God began to talk to them about a land into which he was taking them, a land that flows with milk and honey, a land of blessing, that was good news. That was good news. Hallelujah. So God was speaking good news to them. When God speaks to us about what he wants to do in our lives, he's proclaiming to us good news. The, new, uh, the, the English Standard Version says, For good news came to us just as to them. They had good news concerning the promised land, 
Good news has come to us concerning Christ Jesus. The fact that he came to heal, to save, to deliver. The fact that he came that we may have life and life in its fullness. Good news has come to us just as it came to them. Okay? But the message which they had did not benefit them. It did not profit them. They had good news about coming into the promised land, but they did not enter because they did not unite what they had with their faith. Okay? They did not mix what they had with faith. And for that reason, they could not benefit from the promise. They could not benefit from the promise. They could not enter into rest. What does that mean? That the good news is proclaimed to us so that when we believe it, when we apply our faith to it, then we shall be able to enter into the place of promise. And verse 3 says, verse 3 says, for we who have believed do enter that rest. Please notice that. For we who have believed do enter that rest. As he said, so I saw in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Then the last portion of this verse is very interesting. It says, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. What does that mean? It means that when God gives promise of entering into his rest, he aforehand prepares all that we, shall, we need, all we shall ever need, all we shall ever require, God prepares and provides in abundance. Entry into that which God has prepared is based on our hearing the good news, believing it, embracing it, so that God can then perform it in our lives. So very quickly, how do we enter into rest? One, hear the gospel. Hear the gospel. It is intended to profit us. It is intended to benefit us. It is intended to help us get into the land, into the place of peace. We cannot enter the place of peace in the kingdom of God. We cannot enter rest in the kingdom of God minus the gospel. God, Bible says, God does nothing except he reveals it to his servants, the prophets. That means any time God is going to do anything, he proclaims it, he says it, he speaks about it. Why? So that we can have faith in what he has said, so that we can believe it, and so that it can be performed to us or for us. Praise the Lord. So how do we enter into rest? One, hear the gospel. Why? Because it is intended to benefit us, to profit us. Two, have faith in the word. Have faith in the promise. Amen. Have faith in the promise of God. Amen. Number three, believe the good news. Believe the good news. Amen. Bible says, we who have believed do enter into the rest. What does that mean? That if we do not believe, we will not enter. Just like those in the old covenant who had but did not believe, who had but did not embrace the word. When pressures came their way, when challenges came their way, when wrong report came their way, they abandoned their faith. They walked away from their faith. They did not believe and for that reason, they could not enter into the rest. Hallelujah. Though God had finished preparing from the foundation of the world, he had completely provided for them. It's amazing. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 9, the Bible says, Second Corinthians chapter, uh, my apologies, let's do ch uh, chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, reading from verse 9. The Bible says, chapter 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, from verse 9. Scripture says in this portion, 
It says, but as it is written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. Notice here that God has prepared some things for those who love him and for those he loves. Okay, that's very true. God has prepared. Bible says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Hallelujah. The spirit of God has duty of revealing to us the things that God has prepared for us. In this portion of scripture, it talks about those things that are freely given to us by God. Okay? I believe that would be about verse 7 or verse, verse 8. It talks about those things that are freely given to us by God. Okay? There are some things that God has freely given to us. Okay? And the Holy Spirit has duty of revealing those things to us. Amen? So very important to understand that how do we enter into rest? We need to hear the gospel. We need to have faith in the word, in the word and the promises of God. We need to believe the good news. Believe the good news. Now, just what's important about believing? Faith is a now position. Faith is the here and now. Now faith is substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Faith is a now factor. Faith hears and right there and then takes possession of something that God has spoken. But believing is the ability to continue in the place of faith. Okay? That's why the Bible says those who have believed, that means those who are able to continue holding their place of faith, enter into rest. You can have faith today, but if you cannot continue to hold it, then, you see, and how do we hold faith? The Bible says through faith and patience. Okay? So patience is that element that whole assists us in holding our faith. That is believing. We continue. We maintain our faith. That is believing. Okay? The Bible says those who believe enter into rest. Amen. Now, number four, under that same category of how do we enter into rest, be diligent, according to verse 11, be diligent to enter that rest. How should we enter into rest? The Bible says, let us therefore be diligent. Be diligent. That means let us be, let us labor. Let us exert ourselves. Let us endeavor. Let us make haste. Okay, You're just reading it from the international version says, let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest. Okay, make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will fall by following their example of disobedience. So that no one will fall by following their So they in the old covenant, by unbelief and disobedience, fell short, came short. And the warning is upon us. The word of God says we should make every effort. Now that's very important. God is a good God. He loves his people and so he proclaims good news to us. But if we are not, if we will not fall short, if we will attain the fullness of what God has planned for us, then we must make every effort. We must be diligent. We must be purposeful. We must be committed. We must be dedicated. We must exert ourselves. You know, the idea that somehow you will be a Christian by... You know, being laissez-faire, being careless, uh, uh, taking your time, being slothful, being um, uh, uncaring, that doesn't work. We need to know that we have an enemy who is not interested in us achieving the things of the kingdom of God, the will of God and the purpose of God. He will do anything he can to distract us, to derail us, to delay us, to confuse us, to move us away from the focus that we are supposed to, uh, or the thing that we're supposed to pursue. He will do anything he can. And therefore, we must understand that we must exert ourselves. You know, reading the word of God, reading your Bible, studying the word, uh, being prayerful, is not going to come easy. 
It's not just going to fall on our laps, like uh, somebody would say, like ripe cherries. You know, it's not just going to fall on our laps, like ripe oranges or mangoes. You know, there is, there is an effort. There is, a, there is a, an exertion. There is a diligence. You know, we must be diligent. The Bible says, let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. Now, that's one of the things that is lacking many times in the body of Christ. Somehow, people imagine that they will somehow enter into the kingdom of God without exerting themselves, without uh, working hard, without being committed, without dedicating themselves, without being serious. The Bible says, let us therefore be diligent that let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest. There is a rest. To enter that rest. Lest at any time, lest at any time, we should fall according to the same example of disobedience. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, what are some of the reasons for failure to enter into rest? What are some of the reasons for which we will not be able to enter into rest. Praise the name of the Lord. One, disobedience. Disobedience. Praise the name of the Lord. If you come with me to about verse 7, uh, verse 7, the Bible says, uh, God said in a certain place, let's start uh, It's it still remains that some will enter that rest since therefore it remains that some must enter it and those to whom it was first preached did not enter because of disobedience. Take note of that. Those to whom it was preached aforehand, those to whom it was declared before, did not enter because of unbelief. Let's read this verse, verse 6 also in the New International Version. Very interesting verse, very important verse. It says, it still remains that some will enter that rest. Okay? God wants his people to enter that rest. And we saw clearly Jesus declaring to us, come to me all you who labor and have laden, and I will give you rest. It still remains that some will enter that rest. And those who formerly heard the gospel preached to them did not go in because of their disobedience okay they did not go in because of disobedience. so one of the reasons why we will not enter in is because of disobedience when god speaks to us and we do not believe him and we don't uh, believe him or we disobey his word see god says this day you are going into Dispossess nations great and mightier than himself. And when they looked at them, the, the, when they heard about the giants and they heard about the, the purported impossibilities, uh, when they were told how they appeared like grasshoppers before the inhabitants of the land, they developed fear and were not able to enter in. It's very important to understand that God's will is for his people to enter in and that disobedience is one of the reasons for which people will not enter in. But number two, it says in verse 7, Therefore God, therefore God, uh, the Newton, okay, again he designates a certain day, saying to, in David, Today, hallelujah, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Now it's very interesting that God doesn't just speak in historical sense, but there is a today. Even as we are listening to truth right now, seated in your house or wherever you are, listen to the Bible study, upon you is a today. Today is the day that you hear the word. Today is when the word of God comes to you. The word of God says when the word of God comes to you, that is your today. The Bible says today, if you will hear his voice, then do not harden your hearts. Okay? Now, hardening the hearts is a refusal to embrace truth. It is rejecting truth. 
it is a reliance on previous experience or past teachings or things that you have heard before. If you should encounter truth and you reject it on the basis of either your state or your previous experiences or what you have heard or been taught prior, really what you're doing is your heart is hardened. If you hear truth but do not like it or you do not uh, uh, believe in it, you actually are hardening your heart. If you hear the word of God, but you have other things you're more interested in, more other things that you love more than the truth that you're hearing at present, then you have hardened your heart. Word of God says, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your heart. It's, it's up to you. It's up to the hearer to soften their hearts towards God, to allow their hearts to receive and embrace the truth of God's word. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Now, after he has spoken to the children of God about rest and the importance of hearing, you know, uh, the importance of this rest, he shows us that, please notice here in verse 7, it says, again he designates a certain day saying, notice again, saying in David, today, after such a long time as it has been said, today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts. Listen, God's avenue for blessing, God's avenue for release, God's avenue for victory, God's avenue for cleansing, for healing, for, for breakthrough, is his word. In verse 12, which brings me to the second part of what I wanted to talk about today. The first part we've been talking about entering into rest. The second part is the word and its place in entering into rest. The word and its place in entering into rest. Okay? Chapter two, Hebrews 4 verse 12 says, For the word of God. Okay? Notice, first of all, he said to us in verse 7, that if today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts, Hallelujah. Do not harden your hearts. When he comes to verse 12, he says in verse 12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Okay? So the word of God, which is God's basic agent, for victory, for blessing, for healing, for, for everything. Anything and everything we'll ever gain or get out of God will come by our engagement with His Word. His Word is living. Hallelujah. It is living and powerful. Another translation says, uh, looking at the New International Version and then to the Amplified Bible, the in New International Version says, For the word of God is living, notice, and active. It is living and active. Okay, It's not dormant. It is active. And it is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. Praise the name of the Lord. The Amplified says, for the word of God speaks and is alive and full of power, making it active, operative, energizing, and effective. The word of God is able to help us. The word of God is able to work in us. The word of God is able to, you know, to divide and change the situation and circumstances of our heart. I love the scripture in the book of uh, uh, John chapter 15 and verse 3. Very precious verse. John 15 and verse 3 declares, I am the vine. No, it says, You are cleansed and pruned already because of the word which I have given you. The teachings I have in the King James it says, you are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. So the word of God is a cleansing agent. 
The word of God brings us to victory, brings us to blessing. Hallelujah. So the word of God is the agent by which we shall enter into rest. That word, when we receive it, it is living and it is active. It is powerful. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. Hallelujah. It will aid us to advance towards our place of rest. It will enable us to, you know, understand the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. It will help us in judging the situations and circumstances of our lives. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So the word offers rest and is able to penetrate beneath the surface. Praise the name of the Lord. The word is able to penetrate beneath the surface, beneath our thoughts, our intents. It's able to tell whether or not we are sincere or whether we are just uh, playing games. Okay? The word of God is powerful. The word of God is powerful. The word of God is needful. And it is God's agent to bring transformation to our lives. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Okay, so the first part we were talking about is entering into his rest. Number two, second part we're looking at is the word and its place in entering into rest. The word of God is God's miraculous agent for victory, for blessing, and for everything we ever need in this life. Amen. The third part of what I'd like us to talk about in the book of Hebrews chapter 4 is um, starting at verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, reading from verse 14. And we're talking about the great high priest. Hallelujah. The great high priest. The Bible says, seeing, seeing then that we have a great high priest, who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession, as another translation would say, our profession. Okay, verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Verse 16, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Glory to Jesus. Now, let me first start by saying that the will of God is for every one of us to make progress and enter into rest. God has called us not that we may be destroyed in the wildernesses of sin, the wildernesses of impossibilities or weaknesses. God has not called us that we may be, that we should fall short or come short or be unable to enter in. No, God has called us that we would enter into the fullness of his plan and purpose for us. And for that reason, he also gave us a great high priest. A great high priest. Now, when you talk about a high priest, high priest refers to that person who represents the people to God. We looked at the fact that Jesus was both apostle, that means he was God's representative to man or to people. As high priest, he's our representative to God. The Bible says we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Now let's read this, I'll go back to verse, verse 14. Verse 14 declares, For we do not have a high priest, verse 14, inasmuch then as we have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession of faith. Now this is very important. Go back to um, verse, uh, going back to verse 14, reading it from the New International Version. The New International Version. Therefore, since we have a great high priest, and I want to first take note of the fact that he's referred to as a great high priest. Not just a high priest, but he's a great high priest. Okay? And I believe he's referred to as great high priest because he fulfilled his role. 
He accomplished his purpose. And he's great high priest in the sense that he's greater than Aaron. He's greater than the Levitical high priesthood of or the Levitical priesthood. He's greater than any high priest that was before him. Jesus is the great high priest. He's great high priest because he also represents a greater covenant, the great covenant, the new covenant. Praise the Lord. Since we have a notice that we, you and I have, we have a great high priest. He's our high priest. He is your high priest. Okay. Since we have a great high priest, what about this high priest? This high priest has gone gone through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. It's very interesting to understand. We have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens. What does that mean? He did not only perform his task on earth in the sense on the cross he came to uh, perform an atoning work. On the cross he was to die to shed his blood for us, but he did not end at the cross. Bible says he rose from the dead and he rose through the heavens to present his blood before the mercy seat, before the throne of God. He rose and presented the blood of his atonement before the, in the heavenly sanctuary. He penetrated through the heavens. And it's interesting, it's interesting for us to take note of the heavens. Why the heavens? Because in the heavens is where the powers of darkness operate. But he went through the heavens, taking captivity captive. When he rose from the dead, he made a public spectacle over all the powers of darkness triumphing over them in his resurrection and taking with him those who had been held in Sheol. He rose victorious. He presented his blood before the heavenly sanctuary. Praise the Lord. So we do not have a high priest. We have a high priest who has gone through the heavens. Hallelujah. He has presented his blood before the heavenly sanctuary. Amen. Now, what is important about this high priest? The Bible says he's Jesus, the Son of God. Notice that? He's Jesus, the Son of God. That, when he says Jesus, the Son of God, it's talking about his divinity. He's not only Jesus in terms of the human person, but he's the Son of God or God's Son. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Because we have a great high priest, because we have a great high priest, and it is essential to know that we have a great high priest, a great high priest who came to do a great work, a greater work. Because we have a great high priest, the Bible says, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Hallelujah. We need to understand that we have a great high priest. And for that reason, we are to hold firmly to the faith which profess. The Amplified says, the Amplified says in, 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 in this verse, the Bible says, Inasmuch as we have a great high priest who has already ascended and passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, the Bible says, let us hold fast our confession of faith in him. Hallelujah. Let us hold fast our confession. Now notice here that who is he speaking to? The writer of the book of Hebrews is writing to a people who are going through persecution. People who are ready to give up. And he's say, reminding them, listen, he's saying to them, listen, the high priest we are talking about is not Aaron. The high priest is not of the Levitical priesthood. No, we have a higher priesthood. We have a greater high priest. This great high priest is the son of God. And for that reason, because we have that understanding that he has not come to just reveal and, you know, we are not just in the temporal, but we are in the permanent. Hallelujah. We have a greater high priest who is not representing us on just a shadow, but he is in the perfection. He is in the real thing. Jesus, the Son of God. 
For that reason, because we have a great high priest, let us hold fast our confession, our profession of faith in him. Hold fast. Hold it fast. Don't give up. Don't surrender. Don't walk away. Don't think it is too hard. No. Hold fast. In other words, what is it that will help us go through challenges? What is it that will help us go through obstacles? Knowledge. Knowledge of who he is. Knowledge of our high priesthood. Knowledge of whom we have believed. Do you know Christ? Do you know Jesus? Do you know who he is? Now very interestingly, going to verse 15, begins to describe this high priest. The Bible says in verse 15, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to understand and sympathize and have a shared feeling with our weaknesses and infirmities and liability to the assaults of temptation. But one who has been tempted in every respect, as we are, yet without sinning. Listen, he's saying to us, the high priest we have, he's a great high priest. And he's one who is able to understand. Not only is he able to understand, but he's able to sympathize. He's able to also have shared feelings. Because he has been where we have been. See, Jesus was able to be our high priest. He was able to perform his task as our savior because he went through what we go through. He was tempted. The Bible says he was tempted in every respect. He was tempted in every respect. Now you see, if you say tempted in every respect, it means he was not only son of God, but he was also son of man. In his capacity as son of God, he would not have been able to understand what we experience because he cannot be tempted as son of God. He was Jesus, that means human, and for that reason he was able to experience exactly what we go through. He was tempted by Satan. He was presented with the opportunities to turn away from the will of God. He was given um, opportunity by the enemy to succumb to every kind of pressure. The Bible says he was tempted in every respect, but did not succumb to sin. He did not give in to sin. Hallelujah. He did not give in to sin. And for that reason, he's able to help us. That was, that's what we saw in chapter 3. He's able to succor. He's able to help those who come to him. So, our high priest, our great high priest, is able to understand, is able to sympathize, is able to have shared feelings with us. He's able to understand our weaknesses. He's able to understand our weaknesses. And in others, he's able to understand when we go through pressure. Not that we should succumb to the pressure, not that we should give in to weakness, no, but he can understand when you go through challenge. And for that reason, he's present to help us. Why? Because he has been through it. He knows, he cares, he understands. He's able to sympathize. Amen. Now, we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses. Why? But was in all points tempted as we are, but did not sin. Yet without sin. He did not sin. Hallelujah. Verse 16 says, Because we have this great high priest who has been through what we, have go, what we go through, who has journeyed through what we, have, we journey through. Remember, the book of Hebrews describes him as the author and the finisher. That means he went through what we go through. And he's, he, he journeyed through everything we go through. And he's able to teach us. He's able to help us. Why? Because he went through it. He's the author and the finish of our race. The Bible says in verse 16, Let us therefore, because of the nature of this high priest, the Bible says, Let us therefore, let us for this reason, come boldly to the throne of grace. Hallelujah. The Bible says, Let us therefore come boldly. 
let us come boldly. We may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. Let us come boldly. That means you don't need to come fearfully. You don't need to come without confidence. You don't need to come with uncertainty. The Bible says, let us therefore, in the Amplified, it says, let us, let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace. Why? Because at the throne of grace, there is our great high priest who knows us, who cares about us, who has been through what we go through. The Bible says, let us then fearlessly and confidently and boldly draw near to the throne of grace, the throne of God's unmerited favor to us sinners. Why? That we may receive mercy. What does that mean? That every child of God needs to understand that there is help for me in the great high priest. And for that reason, because he's there for me as my high priest, I can boldly, with his blood, go before the throne of grace. I can draw near to the throne of grace and obtain mercy. And obtain or receive mercy for the, the mistakes, the shortcomings that I may have come up. Now listen. Mercy is to be obtained for past failure. Mercy is to be obtained for past mistakes. Mercy is to be obtained for past sins. When we come before the throne of grace, we will obtain mercy. That means we will be justified. Romans 5 and verse 1 Romans 5 and verse 1, very precious verse. It says, Romans 5 and verse, 5, verse 1 says, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we come before him, hallelujah, when we come before the throne of grace, we will be justified. We will be justified. Going back to verse 16, we will be justified. Okay, the Bible says, therefore, come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy. Okay, So if, the, in, if for any reason we have come short, if for any reason there has been a failure on our part, now notice here, chapter 4, verse 16, really verse 14 through verse 16, is not suggesting that we should continue in weakness. No, it is stating that if for any reason we should come short, we should remember we have a merciful high priest. We have someone who understands, who has been there before, who knows what we go through, who is able to help us. So we can come before him that we may obtain mercy. Hallelujah. Mercy helps us to be justified. Mercy helps to be justified. That means declared guiltless, declared free of sin. Hallelujah. And not only do we get mercy, but number two, we gain grace. The Bible says, and find grace to help in the time of need. Not only do we, are we to come before the throne of grace and be forgiven of our sins or have received mercy from God. That's not all. We come before the throne of grace that we may find grace to help. What is the grace about? At the throne of grace, we we. We, we, we can gain, we procure grace. We procure grace for the present and the future. So if I come before the throne of grace, I can obtain mercy and be relieved of my failures and shortcomings. But two, at the throne of grace, I obtain grace. I obtain grace. That grace is designed to help me for the present and the future. Are you in need of strength? Are you in need of courage? Are you in need of boldness? Are you in need of what it takes to go on to victory? Come before the throne of grace. Obtain mercy that cleanses you 
and declares you justified but not just that you obtain grace as well that helps you in the season of need in the time of need as you advance into your present and your future there is grace for victory there is grace for success there is grace for well-being the lord is good he is our help he is our strength Come boldly before the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in your time of need. Do not give up. Do not turn away. Do not turn from God. Know that he is there to help you. The Lord bless you. Thank you for being part of this Bible study. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord give you strength and courage and the ability to succeed as you advance in God. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for being part of this Bible study. I invite you to be part of our Bible study again on Thursday, same time, 6 to 7 p.m. And we'll be looking at chapter 5 of the book of Hebrews. God bless you.